Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 66, The National D-Day Memorial in Bedford, Virginia. Before we get started, please remember that this episode is in an MP3 format, so there are pictures showing you the different parts of the memorial as they are discussed. A few months ago, I visited the National D-Day Memorial and wanted to share my experience with you. And as you'll see from the photos, it was a perfect day. The leaves were at their fall peak, and the monument was a fitting tribute, as much as any monument can be, to those who gave their last full measure. When you leave the D-Day Memorial, two things will be etched in your mind. The first, the words valor, fidelity, and sacrifice. The second is the beauty of the Blue Ridge Mountains. The memorial is located in Bedford, Virginia, because soldiers from that town suffered the highest per capita losses in the United States on June 6, 1944. On that date, 150,000 Allied troops landed along a 50-mile stretch of beach in northern France. More than 5,000 ships and 11,000 aircraft supported the invasion. For General Dwight D. Eisenhower, that day was a crusade where, quote, we will accept nothing less than full victory, unquote. And victory for that day was defined as having gained a foothold in enemy territory. And by the end of that day, 9,000 Allied soldiers were either killed or wounded, but victory was achieved. In all, 12 areas in Virginia offered up a company of soldiers. The Bedford Boys, as they are known, was in Company A of the 29th Infantry Division of the National Guard's 116th Infantry Regiment. And all of us in Central Virginia drive on Interstate 29 named after that infantry division, every day. The division was activated on February 3, 1941. By June 1944, around 30 Bedford boys were still in Company A. But amazingly, at least to me, one of their number had been transferred to the 1st Infantry Division, and during that time, he had participated in the landing of North Africa and Sicily. For Operation Overlord, he would be with the Big Red One as they assaulted Omaha Beach. Company A also landed at Omaha Beach as part of the 1st Division's Task Force O. Of the 30-odd soldiers from Bedford, 19 were dead by the end of that day. But tragically, two more would die during the Normandy campaign, and another two later on. A visit to the memorial starts at of course, the Visitor Center. But it's not just a place to get your entrance ticket. And speaking of which, if the wait is not too long, get the guided tour. You and a group of people can ride around on golf carts, stopping everywhere, while the guide points out everything, and I do mean everything, and gives you the details. Then you can walk the memorial later by yourself. It's not that big, and as long as you start early enough, that shouldn't be a problem. Besides, the people there are really great, and it's definitely worth the extra time. But after you get your ticket, don't just jump in the car and head up the hill. The center there has plenty of exciting things to see. In no particular order, there's a model of the entire monument, which not only is amazing, but it helps you get your bearings once you start your tour. There's also things like Eisenhower's dress jacket, which I desperately wanted to try on, but the workers there were keeping a close eye on us, probably because we brought our two small girls with us. There's also several display cases that shows you what the soldiers had to carry around with them in their sack, their shaving gear, their toiletries, a little book called In Case You're Captured, lots of different mementos. Those were interesting as well, just to see what the daily life was like for the U.S. soldier. There's also a movie set up for you that starts every couple of minutes. Um, the movie itself doesn't have anything new in it, but it does a pretty good job of setting up D-Day. So it really gives you a perspective or sets the mood as you start to go up the hill to see the memorial. But before we leave the visitor center, let me give you a word of warning. To the side is another room where you can buy things and pay for them there. However, all the shelves in that room are made of glass 
and they're not standing on a base that comes up from the floor. They're all hanging down by pieces of string, which to me seems incredibly unwise. But anyway, if you touch one string, you not only knock over an item from one shelf, you knock over items from all the shelves. So if you're not very careful, you will end up buying hundreds of dollars worth of items you probably didn't want in the first place. So keep your kids out of that little glass room. Trust me, I'm speaking from personal experience. Okay, so after you look around, you jump back in your car and you head up the hill. It's only like a 30-second drive. Now that you're ready to start the tour, there's one thing you need to know about the monument. When you walk from one end of it to the other, provided that you started at the correct end, the entire monument is a chronological journey of the events that led up to and happened on June 6th. And of course, as you start your journey, um, you want to show the proper respect, no loud noise, no monkey business, that kind of stuff. Uh, I saw several vets there from different wars and they wouldn't have appreciated it very much. So the beginning of the memorial and of your journey begins at the Richard S. Reynolds Senior Garden. And you can see it here at the bottom of this picture. Its design and the plants around it borrow from the architectural style of Norfolk House in London and Southwark House in Portsmouth, where much of the D-Day planning took place. The garden holds the sculptor, the Supreme Commander, of course, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The commander faces towards the memorial's representation of Normandy. Now, above Eisenhower's head, on the underside of the roof, is a replica of the map at Southwich House, which the planners used for the invasion. And at Eisenhower's feet is the handle of a very large sword lying on the ground that points away from the Supreme Commander towards the center of the monument. It's at least 30 feet long and has beautiful flowers within the sword. And of course, sword is the code name for one of the five beaches invaded that day. Around either side of the sword is a beautiful lawn that, at its edges, has busts of Eisenhower's main subordinates. I may not have pictures of them all, but here are their names. Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur William Tedder, Deputy Supreme Commander. Admiral Sir Bertram H. Ramsey, Allied Naval Commander. Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford L. Lee Mallory, Allied Air Forces Commander. Field Marshal Sir Bernard L. Montgomery, D-Day Assault Commander. Lieutenant General Omar N. Bradley, U.S. First Army Commander. And finally, Lieutenant General Walter Beadle Smith, Chief of Staff. At the far edge of the lawn with the bust, you come to another beautiful flower arrangement that's an arc. And if you take that arc along with the garden that's around the giant sword, it has the shape of the patch worn by the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. When you pull back in this picture, you can see it clearly. And just beyond those flowers is a wall that has the text of Eisenhower's Order of the Day for June 6, 1944. And on either side of that text, in landing order, are the unit monuments honoring the major ground forces. And here is General Eisenhower's Order of the Day for June 6, 1944. Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force Soldiers, Sailors, and Airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force You are about to embark upon the great crusade, toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hope and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers-in-arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940 and 41. The United Nations has inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle, man-to-man. -man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war, and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. 
I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. After the wall, you are ready to go up the stairs and enter the center of the monument. And you can take either two sets of steps. The steps to your left house monuments to academies, colleges, and universities that helped the Allied leaders prepare for wartime service. The steps to the right honor the infantry regiments in landing order that took part in the Normandy invasion. It also honors the 12 letter companies of the 116th Infantry Regiment. Once up the stairs, you are at what is considered the main part of the memorial, the plaza. It's a large open area that represents the channel crossing and landing. If you've ever seen photos of the D-Day Memorial and see large groups of people standing around, that's where they are. The plaza is broken up into five sections by lines running from the area you just entered, coming up the steps, straight to the landing craft and beach tableau. The five areas, of course, represent the five beaches landed at that day. Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and of course, Sword. Now, the plaza and the beach tableau are within a giant circle, and on either side of that circle, as you walk towards the landing craft, have short walls that house bronze tablets. To the west, or on your right side, the U.S. service members are commemorated. To the east, or on your left, lists all the other Allied forces involved in the landing. When you finish crossing the plaza, you come to the water tableau and a stylized Higgins boat that demonstrates the different types of craft used to take the men ashore. The boat's door is down, and if you get right behind the craft, you get a real sense of what their view was like as they jumped down into the water. The open door of the craft is lying in the water of a pool, representing the early flood tide. Also, in the water are two hedgehogs and several sculpted figures. The hedgehogs, of course, are things that you've seen in every war movie, the big pieces of iron crossed and welded together. They were made that way because even if a bomb or a shell landed near them and blew them and tipped them sideways, they would still be up, right side, giving tanks a hard time of getting onto the beach. Now, this part of the memorial is the hardest to convey, and it's the most emotional. That's probably why. The figures in the water and the ones attempting to climb up the wall behind the tableau, which is, represents a cliff, um, are simply overwhelming. And each figure in the water represents different stages of the amphibious landing. One represents through the surf, the next death on shore, the next across the beach, and the last one scaling the wall. There's a walkway between the water and the figure attempting to climb the wall so you can get very close. And I highly recommend that you stand there looking at the opened landing craft. The reason for that is there are points in the water where bullets striking nearby the figures is simulated. And this may sound rather simple, but the effect is memorizing. Staring at it, you actually get a sense of what it would be like to leave your craft, jump down and run through the water while bullets are landing near you. But really, honestly, I have no words that can describe this. Turning around on the walkway with your back towards the Higgins boat, you see the figure climbing the wall. As vulnerable as the men were on the beach, here there was nothing they could do to defend themselves, except climb faster, get to the top, and start to establish a perimeter and cover fire for those coming behind them. It was very moving uh, watching them remember and talking with her friends. I love that sound. The sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. What are you waiting for? Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale 
reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash worldwar2, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash worldwar2 right now. Shopify.com slash worldwar2. So when you're ready to go to the next level, to where the man climbing the wall is trying to get to, you can, again, go either way, to the left or to the right. If you go to the left, you'll pass by a small plane that represents the Allied Expeditionary Forces, Air Forces that day. The plane is very small, and you can't help appreciate how vulnerable those pilots and observers were. If you go to the right, you pass by a monument to the naval forces who participated in Operation Neptune, the actual ferrying of troops across the English Channel. Placed there are a bell and anchor, the symbols of naval service. Now, once you get to the top, your feelings will probably change from mind-numbing fear to admiration as you come upon the triumphal arch celebrating the success of the Normandy landing and the gaining of the beachhead. Again, I wish I had the words, but its structure is simple yet inspiring, just like what those men accomplished that day, the survivors and those that perished. Inscribed at the top is the word Overlord, the code name for the entire operation. And for me, the arch, in its simple majesty, celebrates the victory achieved that day, the beginning of the end of Nazi domination of Western Europe, but also what that victory cost. And now you come, at least to me, to the most eerie part of the monument, as chilling as the the boat and the water and the bullets coming to those figures was. When you get to the top, um, at the top of the wall where the man is trying to climb, there is a simple, beautiful, elegant monument that's just sitting there and you don't expect to see it because it's so small and it simply is an inverted rifle with a helmet sitting on top of it. And you don't think much of it first, but the more you look at it, the more you think about the 4,400 men or so that died. And if you add the wounded, that number goes to 9,000 and somehow with that simplicity, it just moves you and it just makes you so sad, but you're so thankful for what those men did. I didn't think anything after the beach tableau was going to move me, but that, that part really stayed with me. Now, right under the arch is the seal of the National D-Day Memorial, and inscribed in the floor, written in Latin, is the phrase, Remembering their valor, fidelity, and sacrifice. Just past the Overlord Arch is a half-circle of flags and corresponding plaques under those flags, separated into two equal parts of six each. The United States flag is farthest left. The other flags are in alphabetical order. And each plaque underneath its flag speaks of the contribution of that country. Those countries that shared in the sacrifice were Australia, Belgium, Canada, Czechoslovakia, France, Greece, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Just beyond the half circle is the sculpture Valor, Fidelity, and Sacrifice within a flower box. This represents literally the character needed to accomplish Operation Overlord, but also for me, the very human trait of not giving up on a friend or leaving someone behind. Now, beyond the sculpture, there's a lawn that expands. And that expansion represents the Allied forces spreading out, defeating the German Blitzkrieg tactics, and any hope of containing the Allied forces. And in the middle of that lawn is a straight line that continues on from the flower box. And that walkway continues on until you reach the garrison flag, the goal of the men. 
On a side note, some German commanders were of the opinion that it was best to let the Allies land and then push them back into the sea with their panzers. Others thought this foolhardy. But either way, the Allies came on shore and stayed there. Walking a little further, and we are near the end of the monument, you come to the sculpture Le Monument à Mort. I'm not sure how to say it. Google Translate wasn't very helpful. It's Le Monument AUX space M-O-R-T-S. This was dedicated in 1921 in memory to a group of soldiers during World War I. But during the initial firefight of D-Day, as the Allies came ashore, a piece of shrapnel struck the head of this figure. For many, this disfigured artwork represents the damage done to Europe during World War I, and that a second world war only furthered that damage. And at the end of the walk stands the Purple Heart Monument underneath the garrison flag. And although dedicated in particular to those who received the Purple Heart on D-Day, it also honors all recipients of the award. And around the garrison flag are busts of the big four Allied commanders. Winston S. Churchill, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Joseph Stalin, and Chiang Kai-shek. Of course, there's some controversy around Stalin's bust, but that is an ongoing debate. The organization that runs the memorial has a total of 88 acres, so there are more things planned. But, just like everything else in the world right now, they are waiting on the funds needed. So that was a quick tour of the memorial. I hoped you liked it. I hoped it made sense. And if you ever do get a chance to see it, please do. Its simplicity may not be what you expect, but the place does have an air about it that lets you know something amazing was accomplished that day by those men, many of those who wouldn't make it back home to celebrate. Hello, everyone. This is Ray Harris. Before we do the drawing for the Replica newspaper, I just wanted to give you some audible recommendations for D-Day. Um, I know we're not anywhere near there yet, but in case you wanted to jump ahead and do some reading, um, I just wanted to offer something up, okay? So the, there's a, a lot of books on Audible about D-Day, but I just I think I picked the top five or six um, after reading the recommendations and the descriptions. Um, these are the ones I want to uh, recommend to you. So the first one is Double Cross by Ben McIntyre, and I think that one's only been out for a couple of months. That's a pretty new one. Um, Dog Company by Patrick O'Donnell. Um, Six Armies in Normandy by John Keegan. And of course, if anybody's ever read John Keegan, you know he's an amazing historian and writer. Uh, next is uh, Juno Beach, Canada's D-Day Victory by Mark Zulk. And finally, of course, everyone knows this one, D-Day, June 6th, 1944, by Stephen Ambrose. And I think there's two versions of that one on Audible. So take a look at those, and now here is the drawing for the Replica newspaper. Greetings, everyone, from my part of Central Virginia. So today we're going to do the drawing for the Replica newspaper from December 8th, 1941. And as you can hear in the background, my daughters are very excited to help me, I think. Okay, so so the best I could come up with is all three of my ladies here are going to draw a name. Those will be the three finalists, and then I'll pick randomly from those three finalists, and that will be the winner. Um, I hope that seems fair to everyone. That's the best I could come up with. Okay, so who wants to go first? Sophia? You want to give me a name? Just pick a name. Pick a name. Okay. All right. So Christopher G is the first finalist. Okay. Kiara. Here you go, Daddy. Thank you. Mike L is the next finalist. Okay. Heather, please. All right. And Harmon M is the third finalist. So what I'm going to do is get these girls under control and draw a finalist, okay? So, had it, the wife is mixing them up. Okay, thank you, sweetie. And the winner of the Replica newspaper is... Mike L. Yay! Yay! Woo! Yay! 
There you go, Michael. Okay, so Michael, I will be emailing you soon. Not that you'll know this because it's not live, but I'll get to you soon, get your address, and mail it out to you. So thank you, everyone who's entered. Thank you, everyone, for all the nice comments over the Christmas break and stuff like that. My youngest daughter's making faces at me while I'm talking. Um, I wish... Okay, don't... Okay, so thank you, everyone. I finally got in my books about the invasion of Greece, so I'll be coming out with episode 67 very soon. I know that's what you want to hear. Um, but I'll, So I'll get it out as soon as I can. But until then, I hope you all have um, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, or whatever you celebrate, and a Happy New Year. And I'll be seeing you soon. Take care, everyone.